Good morning, everybody. Thank you. So it's my great pleasure to welcome you this morning to our International Echoes, FameLab International Echoes in Prague. Um, my name's Denise Waddingham. I'm the director of the British Council in the Czech Republic. And um, science communication is one of the things that we do in, in our cultural relations work. It's very important to us. And FameLab is just the most wonderful um, competition, I think. So I really hope you're going to enjoy this morning um, with these wonderful FameLab winners from very various parts of Europe. Um, but I'm really not going to say very much because I'm going to let you enjoy the show. Um, my main role is to introduce our um, extraordinary uh, science communication ambassador here, um, Dr. Michael Lonsborough, who's been a great supporter of FameLab since we started here about eight or nine years ago. And so um, have a great morning. Michael, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Denise. Uh, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, this year's Echoes, which is always a, a privilege to uh, attend and be part of. I mean, uh, we're sitting now in, a, in the wonderful city of Prague. I gather from some of our contributors today, it's the first time in Prague, which is a, a city which 500 years ago became one of the most important cities in the world because of Rudolf II, the, the king here, who realized that to create an internationally important city, you have to be truly international. You have to attract people from all over the world to talk about what they're doing, what their ideas are. So it's a great privilege, I think, and a pleasure to have some very talented young scientists who are going to be talking about what they're doing or ideas they have, some of the experiences they've, they have as well. So that's a, a great privilege. So thank you very much for making the journey to Prague and being part of the science that we have here in Prague. Big thank yous also uh, belong to the British Council, of course, and the British Embassy in Prague for helping put together today's, not only today's um, event, but also FameLab per se. And uh, also big thanks to other other participants in this effort, the Academy of Sciences here at the Czech Republic, Czech centers, uh, Tomáš Batí, the foundation of Tomáš Batí, Adeto, and of course, Cheltenham festivals that came with the original idea of FameLab. Maybe a, a show of hands, who understands or knows what FameLab is about? Okay, only, only a few of you. Right, so FameLab is a, a sort of, it's a competition for young, talented scientists. They, each have, they each have three minutes in which they can talk about um, a scientific subject of their choice. Often it's their own scientific subject that they're participating actually in the, the research of. And they have three minutes on a stage like this in order to uh, you know, enchant you all with their, with their science. Uh, this, their, their delivery of their talk is, is adjudicated by a, a panel who then eventually select a winner, a national winner. And the national winners of this competition then uh, travel to Cheltenham in England, where they have also another international uh, FameLab competition from which the, the winner is selected. And today we have uh, the national uh, winners or finalists uh, from several uh, European uh, countries. So once again, thank you very much for making the trip to Prague. But today is not a competition at all. It's about, it's a celebration of their success. It's uh, an opportunity to, for us to absorb and enjoy what they have to say. And after each, uh, after each contribution, we're going to open up to, to you and uh, you're going to be free to ask questions either on what they had to say or indeed something about them or anything else you'd like to ask them uh, which regards science, technology or, or for that matter anything else. And uh, so it'd be good to sort of barrage them with some questions whilst we have them and you know explore the insights that they have, go into their neural pathways and, and, and have some fun with their scientific knowledge. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick off. We're gonna kick off with our first contributor, who is a young scientist from from Hungary, and her name is Agnes uh, Kistort, and uh, she is currently working at the Department of Atomic Physics at Erdves Lorand University in Hungary, and uh, so atomic physics. But she 
began with a passion for mathematics and uh, then eventually during that exploration of this inner passion for mathematics also discovered within her a passion for teaching. And in fact, we were speaking a bit early on with Agnes and, and she was telling me she's just returned from a, a teaching sort of session where she, she's injured herself slightly. She's, she's uh, burnt her thumb in, in two extreme ways because she, she burnt it with liquid nitrogen, which has one, it was one of the, the coldest substances in our, in our universe at minus 198 degrees Celsius. And then subsequently burnt it again when exploring uh, rocket fuels. So uh, Agnes, I'd like to invite you on top with your injured thumb. Uh, which you can maybe uh, waggle at the audience. Welcome. Uh, now, Agnish, uh, if, I, if, I, if I understand correctly, you're, you're currently doing your PhD. Yes. And your PhD is in... Uh, oh, sorry, I don't have my mic. Your microphone is not on you? Is it working? Already? It's probably on mute. Is it I, working? I just turned it on. It, it's good? Yeah, okay. It should be good. Uh, is it good? Yes, it's good right now. It's good now. I just had to turn it on. Okay. But, uh, mysterious trick. <laughs> now, Agnes is doing her PhD, and she's, she's working on cosmological ionized bubbles, yeah. which sounds to me like a sort of great marketing thing for a champagne or something. <laughs> I mean, I don't, is, yes. that, is, that the, is that the end point of a the A very big of? champagne, maybe you put some yeah. cosmological ionized bubbles, like uh, that big champagne, like a whole universe. If the whole universe is a champagne new theory, let's... <laughs> we well, Richard it. Feynman did say that the whole universe is in a, in a glass of wine, so it's not too far away. So, yes. so, so, so cosmological so ionized bubbles universe. were at the beginning of, the, of everything? No, actually, they are actually exist right now, and they exist since uh, stars were born and the first galaxies were formed. This is when they started to form these cosmological ionized bubbles because they are around galaxies. Uh -huh. They are very big, <laughs> and they are still there. And can we observe, so we can observe them with, with our telescopes? Uh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> Uh, it uh, needs a longer answer. Did I have time now or maybe later uh, when the question... Well, okay, you can tell me a bit later on or later on. Maybe there might be some questions. But certainly, of the observable but universe... But it's an interesting topic still. Well, I mean, uh, certainly my... my, uh, my I've, I've come this year, I've, I've realised my, my daughter, I've got a little daughter, four-year-old Molly, and she's, she's become fascinated now with looking into the night sky. During summer, I'm sure you enjoyed as well, it was very good views of Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, Venus, all in one one in the, in the sky all together. And uh, so she became interested in looking at, I tell, that's gonna be her Christmas present, so I said, shh, can't tell her. <laughs> but it's gonna, be, it's gonna be a telescope. But you're gonna tell us something about, in this sort of cosmological zoo, as you've described it, this wonderful uh, cacophony of, of what to see in the night sky. Perhaps the most yes. interesting and mysterious are the, the black holes. And Agnes, you're going to tell us a bit about those, are you not? Yes, I'm going so, to talk about black holes. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Agnes. Thank you. <laughs> black holes are the most mysterious creatures. Everybody heard about them. No one has ever seen one. Does that mean that they don't exist? Of course not. Actually, the truth is that a black hole is less like a unicorn or a mermaid. It's not mysterious at all. It's more like an invisible baby. To illustrate this, let me introduce you to invisible little Charlie, who came with me today. Oh, let's sit you here, maybe Charlie. And of course, we brought you a black hole as well. If you please, thank you. Just put it right here. The first similarity is absolutely striking. They are both invisible. The child probably inherited it from his grandfather. On the other hand, the black hole is invisible because an extremely large mass is concentrated inside a tiny little space. Its gravitational attraction is so immense that it swallows everything, even light. And without light, there is no sight. I can see it. Then how do we know that they are actually here? because they are both influence their surroundings. Admit it, if there is a baby in the family, then the whole family's life is gonna be revolving around it. Because the mammy, daddy, and all the sibling life are gonna be affected by this little one, this little cute baby's needs. If we just observe the family member's behavior all day, we're gonna figure out that there is a baby in the family even though we do not see him. With the black hole, it's exactly the same. It has such strong gravitational effect that all the surrounding stars are gonna circulate around it. 
if we just observe the movement of the stars, since they are the one we see, that we're going to figure out that there is a black hole exactly in the middle, even though we do not see it. Oh, I think my little baby just got hungry. It's not a surprise, he's from Hungary, <laughs> of course. Everyone who ever tried to feed a little one knows that only some part of the food will land in his mouth. The rest will cover him, me, whole dining room. And if he starts to cry, then all the neighborhood will know that, yes, little Charlie just having its lunch. I don't know if you ever tried to feed a black hole, but it's exactly the same. A black hole has its lunch time and it finds something to consume. Mm, not exactly baby food, rather some hydrogen stuffed with a little helium and topped with just a pinch of interstellar dust. But when it finds something to consume, it gets so eager that he can finally eat, that things get messy in the process. Only some part of the food will land inside the black hole. The, last, uh, the rest will simply radiate out and cover the surrounding space with light before it gets swallowed. Um, so, what happened with my microphone? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, when it get, uh, it eats, <laughs> I'm sorry, when it eats, it gets uh, so messy that everybody will know. This black hole, which was almost unnoticeable before, when it starts to eat, it gets so luminous that not just the neighborhood, but almost all the universe will know that this black hole is just having its lunch. Actually, it can be more luminous than even a whole galaxy. So these black holes, which usually like to hide, they are actually the responsible parties for the most luminous objects in the whole universe. So are they still mysterious? Not at all. We believe in lots of things we cannot see. For example, we believe in God, love, or bacteria. But when it comes to black holes, we don't need faith. We just need to see the whole picture, the black hole picture, if you want it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Agnes, thank you very much indeed. Uh, any questions about black holes? Any of you want to ask a question about something other than a black hole? Is there a black hole consuming your ideas? Adasha, you've had a question. To us. So, I'm gonna, by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat all the questions so that everybody hears. Okay. So, the question from uh, Dasha was, uh, how close is the closest black hole to us? The closest black hole? That's a tough question, because I don't know the answer. <laughs> but, uh, because there are um, different types of black holes. Uh, for example, there are the supermassive black holes, which are in the uh, middle of uh, ga big galaxies. For example, in our galaxy, the Milky Way also have a very big um, supermassive black hole in the middle. So it's like, uh, I don't know in, in, in the normal measurements, because uh, in astronomy and astrophysics, we use uh, different kind of measurements, like parsec. Do you, anybody know the parsec? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about yes. There you go. <laughs> yes. So it ate eight, uh, uh, hundred, uh, eight thousand parsecs away from us. Uh, I'm gonna, you know, count for you after <laughs> this. How far is it? So there is a supermassive black hole in the middle, but there are other uh, black holes which are smaller ones, and uh, they are actually like sun-sized uh, black holes, and they are all around the galaxies. But I'm not sure which one is the closest, which we actually know that it exists. I don't know the exact number. But it's inside our galaxy, so it can be that far in universe measurements. <laughs> because there are lots of other things outside the universe, our, our galaxy. But let's say, if, if there would be a, a black hole in a neighboring galaxy, and it started to eat a lot of the, the galaxies and you know, mass, would we be able to see this from our planet? Would, would, it, would it emit such light and illumination? Yes, of course, of course. Uh, uh, the most luminous objects which I was talking about, they are called quasars, actually. 
they are supermassive black holes in the, the middle of galaxies, and if they are eating, they uh, can be seen by us, but uh, usually uh, in our surrounding area, uh, the galaxies uh, that are very close to us, we, uh, we don't have uh, any kind of you know, effect. We have uh, more farther objects. It would be really interesting to have uh, very close, uh, something like this very close, because it would be so uh, luminous that it could be even more luminous than our star sun or something, but they are very far away object, and they were discovered the way that they, from uh, this direct, uh, this uh, place where we are, uh, they looked exactly like a star, because we just see that there is a very shiny spot in the sky, stars and everything, and the only difference was it looks exactly like a star, but it has um, different spectra, if I can say it, you know, every uh, stars and every galaxy have a spectra, like what kind of light they uh, emit, and they see that. This is very strange. It's not similar to any other stars we see in the sky. What can it be? And uh, it was the first time when they discovered these quasars, this luminous object, when they realized later that it's actually a galaxy's middle, just the middle of the galaxy, but they couldn't see the whole galaxy around it because it was so shiny that it overshined uh, the whole galaxy around it. And this, uh, this was a very interesting, I think, uh, you know, discovery. Okay, so uh, any, any other further questions maybe? Yes, the gentleman here. So the question is, can a black hole ever be destroyed, or does it just disappear? Uh, the black holes can evaporate, uh, that's what we know, that if we are waiting uh, for a very, very long time, they can disappear. And this is good for us because there are sometimes, you know, these concerns that on, on CERN they are doing these micro black holes and everybody is so afraid that what's going to happen if we have a micro black hole and it swallows everything. It's not going to happen because they are so small that they ev uh, evaporate very soon. So every black hole can evaporate at some point, but it's very slow for a very big uh, black hole, so I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> Assume, but we don't know it because if we assume that we have plenty of time or infinite amount of time, maybe in the very, very, very far away future, but we're not going to see it. <laughs> how do we create little black holes in CERN? What, what, what's the actual, do you understand the process? How, how does it? Uh, I'm not uh, an expert, uh, but as far as I know, in CERN, everything has happened the way that they um, make this uh, high energy. Uh, Mm. Collisions. collisions, yes, thank you very much. High energy collisions. And uh, in these high energy collisions, uh, the many things can happen because if you put lots of energy in a small space, it, it can create matter, it can create new particles, it can create uh, new create even little black holes. So yes. I liked your metaphor of the black hole with the baby. Yeah. And I think we all understand how babies are made. <laughs> uh, how, how are black holes made in, in the universe? Mm, uh, there is um, one way we know that how black holes are made, and this is the way when uh, there is a very big star, uh, not like our star, the sun, or uh, if we have a much bigger uh, star, it can, uh, after uh, it finishes its life, every star has a lifetime, you know, it, it, they were born at, some, uh, born at some point and they die at some point. And after these really big stars die, they have this kind of big explosion, like supernova explosions. Usually people hear about this, supernova explosions. And after super, thank you. And after supernova explosions, uh, two things can happen and one of them is it became a black hole. Because of this, you, uh, if, if you want to create a black hole, you have to put so big mass into a very small space. Actually, for, theoretically, it can be done with any kind of you know, size. If we put, uh, for example, the Earth inside a little ball, if we could do that, then we can get a black hole. But in this uh, supernova explosion, there's uh, such a big energy that they can you know, uh, create a black hole inside. And this is where how uh, star uh, sizes black holes were born. And this is what we know. And they can merge at some point. Usually these days there are lots of news about gravitational waves and they always talk about that black holes can, uh, you know, meet and merge together. And they can become bigger and bigger. But the big question, and it's still not solved, that how supermassive black holes were born. Because in the middle of the galaxies there are uh, much more bigger, like uh, 
in in our uh, galaxy it's uh, uh, six thousand six hundred thousand times a uh, solar mass black hole and it can be even uh, like a thousand more bigger and we don't really know how they born uh, we have theories that maybe in the beginning of the universe uh, the stars were bigger then maybe bigger black holes can uh, be born in this time and later a uh, true mergers and lots of lots of mergers they can become this big but we still don't know if it's actually the the true picture. Well, I, I think uh, uh, to discover what su where super black holes come from, the, the, the young gentleman or lady in the back there who knows what a parsecond is will find out. Yeah. So, uh, Agnes, uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Please, thank you, Agnes, yeah. our first, our first speaker. But uh, now we're going to move from from Hungary okay. to Spain and Madrid, and we're going to welcome. Uh, in a, in a short second, uh, Dr. Juan uh, Margalef. And uh, Juan is, uh, well, we just heard about super big, cosmologically large objects. And our understanding of such big things in the universe is, is usually we use um, the theory of relativity, which Einstein developed and uh, enables us to sort of rationalize how these things move and behave and act and, and shine and devour light and the rest of it. Uh, but if we're looking at the very, 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 very small, which is sort of more towards my line of, of work, which is chemistry, then uh, we tend to use more quantum mechanical understandings. And uh, the big problem, or one of the big problems in science, is somehow trying to link the quantum mechanical explanations of the very small with the, the um, relativ relativistic ways of explaining the very, very big. And Juan has indeed done his PhD in trying to understand that. Come, come on the stage, Juan, please. And so he's worked on, on, on using all sorts of uh, very clever mathematical ways to try and uh, bring these two things uh, together. But uh, uh, Juan, I, I, uh, did you, was, that a, was that a frustrating, uh, you know, was it frustrating work? Or, or, or was, it, was, it, was it a beautiful sort of exploration? Um, well, it's not frustrating because uh, we are all aware that it's a very difficult task. And even we don't know if there is a solution. That's, that's sometimes the beauty of, of science. That maybe the solution you're looking for doesn't exist. So, but in, in the way, in the, in the path to go into this maybe non-existing place, you're learning a lot. And you can, you can discover new things. Yeah, so, so it's exciting for me. Yes. I, I think that's, so especially for the younger people in the audience who might be considering a, a life into science, I think this is one of the things that science inevitably gives, gives us all. This, uh, yeah, once you yeah. begin an exploration, you don't know what you're going to find, uh, but you know that what you're going to find is going to be in some way exciting. But Juan, uh, you write here that um, sometimes questions are more important than the answers, and that they can come from the most unexpected places. Indeed. So I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to leave you to, to open up these unexpected places. Ladies and gentlemen, please, Juan. <clears throat> This is Alex, <clears throat> a parrot who was part of an experiment about language in birds. He achieved basic communication and could answer simple questions. But one day, something extraordinary happened. He saw in a mirror his own gray feathers, a color unknown to him, and said, what color? Alex became like that, the first and only non-human to ever ask a question. <laughs> it's amazing. Think about that. He was demonstrating his desire for knowledge, a desire who was thought to be exclusively human. Besides, here we can see how the question is actually more important than the answer. And this is something that has happened many times in science, leading to new realms of scientific thought, the special theory of relativity. It was developed when Einstein was wondering how he would see the world he could travel at the speed of light. Probability, complex numbers, and many other branches arose from questions that might not seem so important at first. In fact, there is a great mathematician called Henri Poincaré who poses a question that's especially intriguing to me. What's the shape of a rotating planet? Planets are spherical, right? But surely you've heard that the Earth flattens at the poles. That's because the planet is spinning, so the equator travels faster, making it bulge outward. So our 
planet gets flatter, the faster it spins. But the question now is, could it be as flat as we want? Well, the, the answer is no. Because if it, if it spun very fast, it would be so thin and big that it becomes unstable. And any disturbance will cause it to collapse. After collapsing, it would take on a new shape, an ellipsoid. This is some sort of rugby ball. And this is not just a mathematical trick, because there exists, it has been found, a dwarf planet called Haumea that has this shape. If it's been, it is pins fast enough to have this ellipsoid shape. Now, what happened if this planet began to spin even faster? Well, it would stretch. And again, at a certain spin, it would be so long and thin that it become unstable. And any disturbance will cause to abruptly collapse. But this time, the shape it would have is even stranger. That of a bullet. Well, this is the answer Poincaré was looking for. But the question gave us much more. Over the years, new branches of mathematics emerged. One of them is the catastrophe theory. It was developed by another great mathematician, René Thom, when he wondered how and why biological structures end up, they have, end up having the shape they have, like the cells, uh, the organs, our fingers, our hand, like Alex feathers, how they develop to the shape they have in the end. Catastrophe theory appears in physics, in biology, as I said, in economics, and even in your breakfast. Because if you put a mag under some sort of light like this, a very shiny one and a spot, you can see like the light will bounce in the side and will form this beautiful pattern. This lit up section is called caustic. And you can see that there is an abrupt change in the illumination. Again, abrupt changes. This is a catastrophe. And it's the same that appears at the bottom of a swimming pool. All these changes, abrupt changes, are catastrophes. So you can see that catastrophes are everywhere surrounding us. So be on the alert of them. In fact, if you are alert enough, the next time someone asks you a question, you might be able not only to respond, but also to discover a new branch of knowledge. That being said, do you have any questions? Thank you, thank you, Juan. So, uh, do you have any questions? Yes, there's a, the, the young man at the back. You put your hand up. Do you have a question? <laughs> nice and loud. What mass is the Earth? What, what mass is the Earth? What mass is the Earth? Oh, wow. Um, I can tell the number is 6 point, uh, 6 point zero two, I think. 10 to the 24 kilograms, but that's a, a lot of mass. Um, how can we put in a something, I don't know, what's, what's, the, what's the largest object that you know? Like an elephant or, I don't know, a whale. Yeah, how many elephants <laughs> is it? How many elephants is it equivalent to? I will say it's uh, like a trillion elephants or something like that. Um, so it's a lot, but it's a good question. But, but that's, a, that's a funny question, how we can um, like comprehend like, the size of things that are completely out of our range. Well, I think it's a really good question because it implies another question. <laughs> how did we actually manage to weigh our planet? Ooh. How do we know the mass of our planet? So I think uh, maybe, do you know how we, can you maybe inform us how we know the mass of our planet? <clears throat> well, the, uh, an easy thing to know is some sort of um, ratios. Like for instance, if you know the ratio, you, you can know the ratio from in between the distance and the time it takes. Uh, you can know some ratios between the mass of the sun and the mass of the earth. But to know the mass alone of the earth, uh, you have to make a lot of assumptions. You have to take the density uh, of the earth. We know the size, that's something that we know pretty well since the ancient Greeks. Uh, and you have to know how the Earth is made. So we assume that there is, um, I don't know, in English, the last lay the layer of, um, how do you call it? The, the core? atmosphere, the layer. Well, you have the core, you have the, the I don't know, in English, sorry. The? Outer layer? Yeah, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but you have like three separate layers in the Earth, and you can guess 
or you can make good estimates like sending, uh, sending some waves or when, when there is, for instance, uh, an earthquake, you can measure the density of things by knowing the, the speed of the, of the, of the waves that, the, that this earthquake is sending. So with that, you can know the density and with that, you can estimate the mass. But it's very, very or difficult. we can even use, like Agnes was using, the, you know, the fact that a baby, you can hear crying, you know yeah. there's a baby there. So, of course, our planet is exerting or, you know, gravitational forces. And thanks to mathematics, we know that the gravitational force is, is also a function of its mass. Yeah, indeed. And therefore, if you know something about how the, the planets are moving, we can work out the mass. But it's a, it's a wonderful question, well done, because it, it leads to all these other scientific discussions. So, because, you know, one might assume, well, how, how heavy, how we know how, what the mass is, we, how the, you know, how on earth can you <laughs> measure the mass? And then it, it sort of, it sets the ball rolling. So thank you very much. And uh, I was going to ask, it was interesting listening to you about uh, the, if you can increase the speed of rotation of, say, a, a planet, then eventually goes to a rugby ball type shape. And at that moment, though, the thing is, if you've got a sphere, you've got, it's a completely symmetrical object. But so you've got this you know, the axis, they've got this one axis of rotation. But once you get it to a rugby ball, then it you've got two possible axes. Indeed. And actually, all, all three axes are different in this, in this solution, not even these two ones that are spinning. You have the short one, and then the two large ones that are one large and the other small one. Um, these short ones, they don't have to be the same. In fact, they, they are not in general. But this is a funny thing, and it took many years to realize that even when the problem was symmetric, the solution has not to be symmetric. They, they can be, but they, there's no need to that. Because certainly uh, atoms have spin, and uh, they, they can sometimes have, you know, they can have, well, not necessarily spherical spins, but also different uh, asymmetric sort of spin and different axes. Maybe that could be the link to linking up relativity to the quantum. I mean, I don't know. But, you know that's, there's, that's, uh, yeah, that's another. I don't think about it. <laughs> okay, uh, how about any other questions? About, yes, sir. Uh, what causes it to spin faster, like the, from the normal sphere? Well, the, you, I'll just repeat, I'll just repeat oh, the sorry. question. So the question was, what causes planets, presumably, to spin faster? Well, in general, they don't. It's only just a theoretical question. What would happen if they spin faster? But there are ways that they, they spin faster, and usually it's, it, it implies that some objects collide. So when, if you have two bounce, two just they are moving around and they can get together and they spin together and at some point they can merge and they can spin faster that at the beginning. But the, what is, they have to conserve what is called the angular momentum. So if, if there is not some external source, they cannot spin faster. Or, or if there is a rearrange of the mass inside the planet, they could spin faster. That's the same if you, are, you have seen some ice skating that they begin to spin with the arms like far, farther away from the body, and they, uh, at some point, they put really, really tight, they begin to spin even faster. Because in this side, you do that like, and then you spin, you begin to spin really fast. So this is a possible way, but as far as I know, this has never happened, but it could. But all this is just a theoretical question, just to, to see that, like, a smooth change in the input, which is the velocity, causes great changes, like the shape, like really different shape. Okay, we're all spinning on this planet. So any other questions spinning around in your heads? <laughs> it, 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 does, the, does the sun spin? It does, it, it does. does. And, and well, actually, because usually when, when, and probably Agnes knows much more than me, but when things form in the universe, usually they don't just collide to the center. Because things, as I say, maybe they, they go one to the other, but not exactly aligned. So at some point, they almost crash, and they turn around, and they almost crash, and they turn around. So in the end, they're turning around over and over again. So if you do that with a lot of particles, all of them going almost to the same spot, but they begin to spin in one direction. And actually, that's why all the planets spin in the same direction. Have you ever wondered why all in the same direction? Well, because they began to create in the same direction. And, and each of them just create um, a range, a lot of mass around them.
to create the, the, the planet, one here, one here, one here. But everything is spinning in the same, in the same uh, direction. Except, well, there's, there's one planet which is spinning the other way around. Uh, well, it's spinning around the sun in the same direction, but its own rotation is flipped. But it's thought because something hit this planet and just flipped it out. Um, but in general, everything is rotating in the is, same is direction. Is that Venus? Uh, no, it's uh, Uranus, I think. It's one of the, the Neptunus or Uranus, one of those two, I think. But, but the, the direction is the same, the direction around the sun. And the sun is rotating in the same direction. But in a very, very, very slow, slow pace, which I don't know okay. which one is it. <laughs> right, uh, last opportunity. Do you have another question? Yeah. Go for it. Do galaxies spin? Do galaxies spin? That's a good question, and it's the same answer. They do because of that, because uh, for them not to spin, they should like approach all at the same point and just remain steady. But they don't. They always almost go to the same point, but they miss and they go farther away. And again, they go to almost the same spin place and they turn away. So everything is turning. And if, if you see the galaxies, actually they're like, it's most of them or some of them, they're like octopus. Like They have a lot of... Um, arms, or I don't know what it's called. Tentacles. Tentacles. Uh, but they are like in that direction. They are turning, so they have the shape, actually. So yeah, they are spinning, and, and you can see perfectly. If you see just a picture, you can guess that they are spinning, because they have like this. It's like if you take a, a paper, and you just, well, there, there's no paper, but if you take a paper and you just move it, it will bend like that. Like, and and, and uh, are they... It will do something like that. This... You see that it, it falls behind this side. Thank you. And, <laughs> and my pleasure. And are these, are, do the galaxies, are they randomly spinning in random directions or do they all have a, the same sort of uh, direction? No, in, of in the galaxies, as far as I know, it, uh, they, they, they are like very random. Even the, the plane, they're not the same. They can be like that. And because they're like, again, this is an immense number that we cannot even understand. Like there are, Literally a lot of galaxies. Oh, there's another question. Yes. Can space spin? Oh, can, can space spin? Wow, we're getting really, we're getting really deep now. Okay, can can yeah, space spin? Philosophical. Um, <laughs> it can indeed, but it's um, very in a very mathematical sense that is um, complicated to explain. You you can think of the space if it's like water, like, which is flowing. Uh, and for instance, if you have a black hole, black hole, it's like a sink, that everything goes there. So there are some theoretical, at least, possibilities that, that everything is not only going to the sink, but it's also spinning. So if you just stay steady, you don't go directly to the black hole, but you go around. So in this sense, yeah, the space is spinning, but it's... It's subtle. So, yeah, it's, uh, wow, this is very deep and... Very good questions, good questions from the back, I must admit. Very good. <laughs> Some potential genie out here. So, Juan, I think, uh, thank you very much for your wonderful Thanks answers so and contribution. Thank you. Okay, uh, can I ask, do any of you here have your favorite super... Do you have a favorite superhero? Do you read comics and, uh, you know, whether it's Superman or Spider-Man, Batman? Well, uh, for me, certainly my, my first uh, superhero was Batman uh, when growing up. And, and I think uh, this is particularly appropriate because our next speaker, who's uh, coming from Poland, Ruth uh, dudek Wicher, welcome. And you're uh, studying... Yes, a round of applause, please. <laughs> Thanks. Well, Ruth, uh, you're studying at the Medical University uh, uh, of uh, Wroclaw. Yeah, that's right. I'm a pharmacist and, and I'm doing my PhD in microbiology. Your, that university is very close to my heart because uh, it's in 1912, uh, a professor working there, Alfred Stock, uh, made the first boron hydrides and I'm a boron hydride chemist. So, uh, indeed, I went to uh, Wroclaw as a, you know, almost on a pilgrimage to, to visit the university mm -hmm. there and it's, it's a very beautiful place. And Ruth, uh, apart from studying microbiology, of course, you're, you're a musician. And, and yeah. you've got all these wonderful talents uh, other than that. And indeed, you play the, via the violin, piano, and ukulele. Yeah. 
which uh, so next time you have to bring it along to give us uh, to give us all. But you'll be talking today uh, more about uh, bacterial biofilms and uh, other other various compounds related to that, and linking it to Batman. That's right. Indeed. So uh, well, dinner, 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 Batman, and uh, enjoy the talk. Okay. First, please close your eyes. I see you. So please, really, close your eyes and use your imagination. Please, imagine that you are walking through Gotham City. It's a cool evening and the smell of mystery and car exhaust fills the air. Everybody is running somewhere but you are expecting to see something off the wall as befits this legendary city. Maybe you would like to see Batgirl sneaking between skyscrapers or just the fight between good and evil. But suddenly you see Batman laughing at the top of his lungs and just next to him you see the Joker. He's jumping up and down and waving his hands around. They are going into an Irish pub. Now you can open your eyes. Now, what is your first thought? Mine would be, what the hell, where is the hidden camera? But do not judge too early. Batman knows what he's doing. He knows the rule, keep your friends close, but your enemies even closer. Scientists are also familiar with this rule. To fight bacteria effectively, they have to get closer to them and study their behavior and structure. Now they know that bacteria occur not only in the form of free-floating single cells, <laughs> called planktonic, but more often in the form of a biofilm. A biofilm is a structure where bacterial cells are connected to each other, they can communicate, and they adhere to a surface, and all of this makes them much more difficult to get rid of. Every organ in our body is exposed to a biofilm infections, but bone infections are some of the most difficult to treat. And in this case, scientists want to outsmart this biofilm. But how? Well, they combined two groups of drugs. First, bisphosphonates, which are used in the treatment of osteoporosis and bone metastasis. They have a brilliant property. They can recognize bone and they can build into the mineral that create bone hydroxapatite. Second group of drug, it's a bactericidal antibiotic from fluoroquinolone group, ciprofloxacin. After combining these two drugs, the conjugate with the fabulous name BV60022 arises. We will just call it conjugate, don't worry. Uh, how does it work? Maybe I will demonstrate it on, on my own bone, which will be easier. <laughs> okay, after getting into the bloodstream, uh, bloodstream Bisphosphonate searches for bone and builds into the bone, while ciprofloxacin protrudes above the surface of the bone and it forms protective mini umbrella. Ciprofloxacin, she's waiting for conditions that allow her to fulfill her murderous function. When does this happen? When the body triggers an inflammatory reaction due to the appearance of a bacteria. Subsequently, acidification of the environment occurs, which means pH decreases, and this weakens the binding between molecules in the conjugate. After that, ciprofloxacin breaks off and kills the bacteria. It is so easy, isn't it? The introduction of such a conjugate to the treatment will bring us many benefits. We will be able to better fight bacterial biofilm and even prevent its creation. But while we won't know whether Batman figured something out to destroy the Joker, likewise it will take a few years to know if the new conjugate will be effective enough. But one thing can be sure. Scientists and gems seldom agree over Bond, just as Batman and the Joker seldom agree over Gotham City. Thank you. Ruth, uh, thank you for sacrificing your own theme oh. to... Uh, to demonstrate uh, yeah. very effectively how it works. Uh, any questions? Anybody here with old bones that hurt and require a bit of medicine? Yes, at the back? Yes. Yes, you. Uh, I'm wondering, can you use this medicine on your teeth? Uh, exactly, so, yeah. So I'll just repeat the question. So the question is, can this medicine be also used on our teeth? 
Yes, there is a, a syndrome called uh, osteoporosis, and uh, I'm sorry, um, bone necrosis, bone jaw necrosis, and uh, scientists want to use this this kind of conjugate in the treatment of this uh, necrosis in the future. Yeah. But or, or were you thinking more uh, when you asked asked the question? When you asked the question, I was thinking: Is it possible that it can you know keep your teeth clean, as it were? No. So in other no. words, it's killing the bacteria. I you think you're, you're it sort of could be, but it's not. Um, there's no makes sense to use antibiotic in this case. It's no. like more useful to just clean your teeth. Right. <laughs> well, there you go. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I see a big foot at the back. Is that a, is that instead of a hand? No. <laughs> so uh, tell us, are you you're playing a role in this research work in, in working out how this work even more effectively, or is this a story that you came across? Uh, no, uh, this research was led by my friend uh, from the university. The part, in vitro part was done in our university, then in vivo uh, on the rat model was done in California. And we, we are, uh, you know, uh, researcher from Wrocław and we are coping with uh, California. And so, oh, I see, so you're, you're helping the, the part yeah. of the effort that's also in collaboration with that's the people right. from California. So, and as yet, this, this particular methodology has been used with mice, rats, as, as a standard model, yes. rats. Mm -hmm. And what will be the, the problems in trying to use that as well with, with humans? Just, they want to do clinical trials. I see. So, so they need uh, people who are suffering from osteoporosis, for example, or other, other, other bone, bone complaints? Bone in infections. Infections, mainly, yeah. and get that. After, yeah. And is this at all useful for things like arthritis? I don't think so, no. No, no. Okay, uh, any other? Yes. Do you expect there to be fewer side effects if the antibiotic is going directly to the place where it's needed rather than... Of course, fewer, yes. So the, yes. So the question was, would, would we expect fewer side effects if this, uh, there's a very high locational specificity for the, for this, for the drug, for the, for the antibiotic? We expect that there will be less yes, side effects, adverse effects, comparing to uh, just ciprofloxacin in our organism all over. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so if we've got no other questions, then thank you very much thank for you. the contribution. A round of applause, please, for, for Ruth. Now, uh, moving uh, from Poland to the next door neighbor, Germany, uh, although indeed our next speaker, uh, Veli, he is uh, from, originally from Turkey, but he's been studying and working now in Germany, in particular looking at chemistry and mathematics. Uh, hello, Veli. Hello. And uh, Veli, I had a fascinating, well, Veli, of course, has also worked in, in the USA and in, in other venues and, and, and nations and places. And he's developed a speciality using mice in particular, and he's interested how uh, in their de developmental genetics of mice. And fascinating talking to you earlier about how much of DNA is actually useful and non-useful. Certainly when I was learning you know, 101 biology, GCSE biology back in England 20 odd years ago, then we were taught that uh, very little DNA is actually useful. You know, the useful bit that codes for certain proteins, but it's actually junk uh, DNA is what it was used for. It was assumed that it had no use. Now we understand that a lot of it is made from viruses. Yes. And, uh, and indeed, I think you're going to be talking a, a bit about that. So I'm intrigued to learn about how uh, viruses have infiltrated our DNA. And the floor is yours. So hello, everyone. I did my PhD in molecular biology, and it changed me in certain ways. My parents think it's a big mistake. My girlfriend's parents think it's a big mistake. My girlfriend thinks I should clean up the kitchen more often. <laughs> this is all because I stopped worrying about viruses and I started Playing with viruses, I, you know, viruses are so much fun to play with. I will explain why. But, you know, when I say this, you always think about the bad viruses. You always hear the bad viruses, HIV, Ebola. No one talks about the good viruses. It was the same in 18th century England. And um, a virus, it's called cowpox virus, cow, 
Krala, pox virus, saved millions of lives because if you were infected with uh, the Krala pox virus, you wouldn't be infected by a small pox virus, which is a small evil virus, very infectious. 20% of London was infected with, Krala, uh, with smallpox virus, and 35% of the people infected died. But if you had this, the Krala pox virus, you would uh, you wouldn't get the smallpox virus. So an English physician, like the Lucy, the next speaker, wanted to glorify the Krova pox virus, the cowpox virus. So, but he focused on the, the cow part of it, and then he used the Latin word for cow, which is vacca or vaxa. And then we acquired a brand new word, vaccine, vaccina. So, what happened basically was there was a good virus, a bad virus, and a sick cow. And what we remember is a good cow and a bad virus. We already <laughs> forgot about the, the good viruses. It was the same in 17th century Holland. Um, when you look at the paintings, you see that the tulips have amazing patterns and colors only in the 17th century Dutch paintings. Not before, not after, but only in this short period of time. Because at that time, there was a beautiful mosaic virus. It got into the tulip, it integrated itself randomly to the genome. Every integration was a new color. Every integration was a new pattern. And then, an economic crisis took place. And as in all crises, there is someone to blame for. And the Dutch king said, well, let's kill all these evil tulips. Ridiculous, right? But it really happened. So this mosaic virus couldn't find a new host and became extinct. And since then, we never got those beautiful, colorful uh, tulips again. So I thought people would understand me better in terms of viruses when we unraveled the human genome. Because we found out that there are more than 100,000 viruses that are already a part of our DNA. Just to put this in a perspective, the difference between the DNA of an ape <laughs> Ape and the difference of yours, for example, <laughs> there's only 1% difference. And the viruses make up 8% of our DNA. Can you imagine how you would look like without viruses? Let me give you an idea. Viruses are very good at finding new hosts. They have to find a new host, so they are good at communicating with the foreigners. And this is exactly what we all needed when we were embryos. We wanted to talk to our mother. We wanted to attach to our mother. And long, long time ago, our ancestors hosted a virus, and virus talked to our ancestors with this protein called syncytin. And this is exactly the protein now that we use to attach to our mother's uterus. Without syncytin, there is no pregnancy. So thanks to a virus, you got to spend the first nine months of your life in an Alice inclusive hotel of your mother. <laughs> so, Prague, there are still 100,000 viruses to explore that we have no idea what they are doing. So if you hear viruses next time, please just, just don't run away. Bring it to the lab, and we have all the tools for you to investigate whether this virus is a good one, or a bad one, or a dirty one. So. Uh, with this, I would like to welcome you in the labs and in the uh, light of science to explore the viruses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a fascinating, fascinating talk. Okay, uh, at the back there, the, the schools are going to, they have to leave, unfortunately. But uh, whilst they're doing so, there's opportunity for questions about viruses, about your own DNA. Yes, sir. How, the question is, how would, it, how would it, you, you ask them to bring the virus to the lab, how do you bring the virus to the lab? So, the viruses are the most easy things to bring along to the lab, because they are a part of you, so if you walk into the lab, at least 100,000 virus walks in the lab with you. And the easy way to get it is just using a swap, for example, or even if you don't want to actually add viruses when you are working, it somehow, you know, you scratch your skin or something, so your cells, which means the viruses are already there, so the the only thing that you should do is basically find out which wires that you would like to work on particularly. And there are very nice ways of doing it now. <laughs> so, 
So uh, are there different viruses at different parts of your body? Um, they are exactly the same viruses, and they are everywhere. In every single cell, you have the viruses. But some of the viruses are more active, for example, in the brain cells, and some of them are more active in the skin cells. For example, there is one virus that makes a protein called uh, GLNC, very weird name that I don't even remember. And this, for example, is one of the biggest differences between the chimps and humans. So we think maybe this virus is somehow contributing to our intelligence, but this is just a hypothesis that we haven't addressed yet. Aha, so our viruses are not random mutations, the real driving force in evolution? It can be, but we still don't know yet. So we only know them, these good viruses, basically since 2010, which has eight years of history, and we still have a lot to know about them, and this is one of the things that we would like to investigate. Hopefully you will investigate at some point. But is there, is there a bigger diversity, if we compare ourselves to the chimps, is there a bigger diversity in that 2% of protein coding DNA? Mm -hmm. Is there a bigger diversity there than in the 8% the the of the viruses which are in our DNA rather than our chimps' DNA? That's a beautiful question, because it actually brings us back to how we know about this junk, junk DNA. So the difference when you compare the protein, proteins of a chimp and humans, they are almost identical in all the proteins. So we know not more than five proteins that has difference less than 1%, like tiny little bit of it that is different between the chimp and humans. Protein-wise, basically, we are exactly the same. But when you look at a chimp and a human, we are different. And we think, actually, the viruses make this difference to um, show proteins where they should be active and how much they should be active and so on. So that's why we think that the viruses make the main difference between the chimps and the humans, not the proteins. And um, would the influence of viruses, would it come under the category of, of epigenics? Is, is, it, is it also, is that how we communicate? Is that how our genes are sort of, you know, by our interactions, the spreading of viruses or whether they cough on each other or kiss one another or whatever it might be, is that part of the way our DNA is evolving? Exactly. So this is how we actually got to know about epigenetics. So the history goes back to what the viruses actually do. If they just stay there, we don't care. So uh, how, can be they, how can they be good for something or bad for something? And then we found out that actually they affect the epigenetic, um, epigenetics of the DNA. So in terms of they, for example, if there is a protein coding gene, let's say a gene that is related to the eye color, if the virus is there and active, it sort of blocks the activity of this protein that makes you more um, blue-eyed uh, rather than um, brown-eyed, for example. So by not acting direct itself as a protein, but through epigenetic mechanisms, acting on different proteins, actually viruses really shape our body and our color and our height and everything. Yes, sir. No, not only, we don't have any... So the question Sorry. was, uh, is that pathogenic viruses are, are spread independent of genetic histories. Uh, is this also the case with the good viruses? So this is absolutely the case with the good viruses. So we have both the genetic inheritance and non-genetic inheritance that we just acquire. Just to give you an idea, for example, uh, there are um, viruses that we share with the chimps. So we know that these viruses somehow integrated somewhere at the past and it is inherited through our parents to us and also to the chimps. So this is how we actually also make the, um, the evolutionary tree uh, by following these viruses. But there are also new viruses that we know that, for example, came through an epidemic at the time of um, Neanderthals. And then it integrated at that time. So this virus is not observed in any of our ancestors until that point. So we know that some of them are added, it came later, we hosted them later, but some of them are just inherited uh, through our parents. And there is not uh, a single living organism without 
an inherited virus. Viruses are everywhere, from bacteria to plants to fungus to humans. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, maybe, well, there's, there's three questions. Okay, we've got time for two quick ones. Uh, you've asked a couple, sir, so I'll, I'll come back to you later. The lady there in the middle. You're talking about good viruses and bad viruses, so let's go to good viruses, and we have the heroes here. So do you have any viruses you consider to be hero viruses? Do you think they're the best? Okay, so there's good, vi good, good viruses, bad viruses. Are there hero viruses who are the best? So I actually wanted to bring this um, hero viruses um, at the time that Neanderthals um, disappeared. So we now uh, we have more Homo sapiens than Homo neanderthalis. And we think that actually it is possible or it is postulated that there was a virus infection at that time which removed the Neanderthals, made them uh, sick, but not the humans. And a very good way of fighting with the viruses, like it happened in the smallpox and the cowpox virus, is another virus. So we think that there was actually a superhero virus at that time that saved the Homo sapiens, but not the Neanderthals, for example. Okay, thank you. And one last question there. The, the gentleman there had his hand up. Yeah, you. You, you. Um, you mentioned good viruses and bad viruses. Can a, a good virus become a bad virus under certain conditions, or is, it, is the virus um, just good under all conditions? Um, huh. like so a bit, a bit like how Superman, if, if there's some kryptonite around, he'll turn into a bad version of Superman. Can a good virus turn into a bad virus? Is there a kryptonite in the virus world? I'm giving a lot of talks about viruses, and this is absolutely the best question I ever got so far, like for last year. Beautiful question. And we know examples where the good viruses became bad viruses, and the bad viruses became good viruses. And we don't know exactly what changed, what made them bad, and what made them good. And because we know the good viruses only very from, uh, for a very short period of time, um, we cannot really tell the mechanism. But there are examples, for example, in mice that happen spontaneously, that a good virus turned out to be active, like somehow activated, and um, blocked the development of the, the arms of the, the mice. Um, two brother uh, mice we saw like this, one of them had this activation and the other one didn't. And that one had, didn't have the arms and the other one had the arms. So it happened like spontaneously like this and we still don't have any idea how a good virus actually turned into a bad virus. Okay, Veli, before this talks go viral, I'd like, <laughs> to, I'd like to thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you much to Veli. Thank you very much. And, uh, we're going we're gonna to stay on the, the topic of, of health, but we're going to move away from viruses. And uh, I'd like to welcome our next uh, guest, uh, Lucy Guile, who comes from the United Kingdom and working indeed at the National Health Service. Welcome, Lucy. Hi. And uh, Lucy is, uh, well, you're, you're not just a, a doctor. You began, to be, you began as a, well, you were a pediatrician, although now you've changed to become a... So at the moment, I'm working as an anaesthetist, so I'm in my anaesthetic training. Um, Which junior... means she's an expert at putting people to sleep, so be careful. So, yeah, you can try to stay awake. Uh, um, but... but before that, I did a job for a year in paediatric surgery. But you do a few jobs before you choose what you want to specialise in in the UK. I think it's similar in a lot of other countries. Indeed. But Lucy is also, well, you're quite an explorer, really. And you do have a, 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 you know, a grand interest in, in health and health care in exotic locations. And you were telling me briefly about your travels all around parts of South America, indeed, and into, the, uh, the, into India, around the Himalayas. So you've gone through jungles and mountain ranges. And indeed, you've seen in, so over a wide, diverse range of nations and cultures, health care and health work there. And um, today, you're going to be telling us about whether we've become too clean. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so I'm fascinated to, to learn more from your very exotic and, and, and far-reaching uh, oversights about whether we are too clean or not. Ladies and gentlemen, Lucy. Let's talk about the five-second rule. Hopefully most of you guys have heard of this. It's certainly something we talk about in the UK. Basically, it's the idea that when you drop a bit of food on the floor, as long as you pick it up again quickly enough, then it's still safe to eat. 
This is an interesting rule that often involves the stretching of time so that the length of the five seconds is proportional to the deliciousness of the bit of food that you dropped. But that aside, for those of you who don't use this rule or claim not to, I guess you think it's unhealthy, unhygienic? Germs are bad, right? Although Veli told us maybe, maybe not. I'm going to tell you why the five second rule is a good thing. Not because the jam donut that you dropped at the bus stop last week and then picked up and ate, you know who you are. Not because that didn't pick up any germs, but because it did. Now as a doctor, I see patients all the time with allergic conditions like asthma, eczema, food allergy. And the thing that they have in common is that their immune systems are hyperactive, meaning that they try to attack harmless substances in the environment that the people come into contact with, causing these symptoms. Now, the really interesting thing is this is a new phenomenon, or at least the scale of it is. So in the UK, where I work, over the last 30 years, rates of hospital admission with anaphylaxis, which is the most severe, life-threatening form of allergy, have gone up by, how much do you think? 10%, 20%, 50%, Gone? Oh, you spoiled it. They've gone up by 700%. So, I mean, a 1,000 wasn't far off, but that's huge. In 30 years, a 700% rise in admissions to hospital with anaphylaxis, which is life-threatening. So, in lots of countries like the UK and other parts of Europe, and I, I, I don't have the data for here, but I wouldn't be surprised if it were the, were the same, whilst rates of allergy have been going steadily up and up and up over probably more like the last 100 years or so from what we can tell, Rates of infectious diseases over the same time frame have been going down and down and down. And lots of scientists think these trends are related, giving rise to an idea known as the hygiene hypothesis. Basically, bacteria and viruses, as we've heard, have been around for a lot longer than humans, and our immune systems are used to them. The hygiene hypothesis argues that exposure early on in life to a wide range of bugs, germs, trains our immune system and it teaches it what it needs to respond to and what it can just ignore or tolerate. And the argument is that without this, these allergies develop. But it's not time to stop showering. But it is true that our increasingly indoor urban lifestyles just don't expose us to the same range of environmental germs that we evolved with. And it does seem like this has consequences for our immune system. So maybe you don't need to be so afraid of our little bacterial buddies. Some of them might be friendlier than you think and to demonstrate that. <laughs> Thank you. It's also just nice to have a snack when you're on stage. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, uh, any questions? Or would you like to talk to us a bit about your own personal hygiene and whether you think it's satisfactory or enough, too little, too much? How many of you here have any allergies? Ooh, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's, that's quite a lot, actually. It's a, yeah, a significant percentage. It's a lot more than it would have been 50 years ago, from what we can tell from, you know, records from back then. Certainly, it seems... It was I mean, uh, yes, Tasha. So the question is, is if you do have, and in particular adults have allergies, can you, can you help yourself by, for example, dropping donuts on the floor, waiting more than five seconds, three minutes indeed, uh, and, and, then, uh, and then eating them? That's a really good question, and it's one that people are looking into. The answer at the moment is, sadly, probably not. So most of the studies that we have are, rather than like interventional studies, trying that sort of thing, it's more like observational studies. So this, this research or the, this kind of idea has come out of the observation that if you grew up as a child in a household with pets, you're less likely to have allergies. If you had siblings, you're less likely to have allergies. It'd be interesting to see if you have brothers, you're less likely because they tend to be grubbier than sisters, but I don't know if that's the case. Or if you, live, if you grew up on a farm, it's less likely. Um, so I think that question, can we, um, is there anything we can do to sort of mitigate allergies once they've already developed, is a really important one, but I think one that we don't have the answer for yet. But do we, is there an official, because I mean, I've got young children, mm. so should I try not to bathe them so frequently or should I allow them to, should I not be so rigorous in saying, wash your hands before you eat? Should, should it no, not be the- So actually, and a, really, it's a really important thing actually that uh, what I'm not saying is don't wash your hands because actually basic hygiene is one of the things that has uh, reduced death rates enormously over the last hundred years. It's, it's actually really important. But it's more like things, 
um, to do, it's probably to do with levels of antibiotic usage, partly. So we use a lot more antibiotics in the past where we probably didn't need them so much. Um, and if you have young children, I advise you to get them out and about, out into nature, out into the environment, sort of coming into contact at a, a young age with things like just, just the sort of the normal sorts of antigens and things, not only bacteria and viruses that you meet in the environment, probably will make them less likely as they grow up yes. to become allergic to those things. But I have to say probably because actually it's, it's a hypothesis. It's still an area of debate. Um, and I don't think there's clear guidance on what you should do at the moment. Any questions? Yes. Uh, the, the antibacterial uh, wipes that people use, uh, the soap, so, so are the antibacterial wipes that we're all used to nowadays, are they, are they a bad thing to use? So I think there's times when they're absolutely a good thing to use. So if you, before a meal, if you can't wash your hands with soap and water, then anti antibacterial gel or whatever is certainly not a bad thing to use. Or if you've been doing something that, you know, if, if you've been doing something that is obviously dirty or if you've been around maybe farm animals or that sort of thing, actually, those are times when it's really important to get hygiene right. Um, but I do think that probably the level of antibacterial cleaning products and stuff in the house or maybe the frequency with which we use them may be excessive. But it's difficult because there isn't, no one has produced a guide saying this is how often you should wash your sinks and, you know, that, that sort of thing. We actually, we don't really know. So I think there's definitely a place for that sort of thing. With, um, you know, the dogs giving you, licking your face or... Mm. Uh, cultural customs of shaking hands, mm. uh, indeed kissing. I, I'm, I'm presuming that human behavior, in, embracing, shaking hands, kissing, is also linked with the advantages, presumably, of, of some sort of exchange of bacterial content, which could lead yeah. to improvement of immunity systems. You're, you're very widely traveled. Mm. What have you noticed in, in, in various parts of the world? Is there always, is that ubiquitous in human customs, this sort of, this exchange and embrace of some sort in order to... Is, this, is, this, is it valuable? Um, I mean, I think it's probably valuable for lots of reasons, and I think for lots of social reasons as well, and promoting sort of social cohesion and that sort of thing. And there is sort of completely separate from allergy research, there's lots of research showing that people who live very isolated lifestyles have much higher rates of anxiety and depression and that kind of thing. So I think there's... I think you're right. I think probably the exchange of kind of benign bacteria and viruses that aren't pathogenic or aren't usually aren't usually going to make you sick but as Veli has sort of explained there's the the range of sort of bacteria and viruses is ginormous and only a small proportion of those will make you sick and actually probably the the other ones a lot of some of them might be good some of them are just kind of neutral and they're just sort of there but um I think yeah certainly human contact facilitates the exchange of those and that probably is important although obviously you, you do have infectious disease epidemics as well like you know no one wants to catch cholera ebola is definitely a bad thing but so like there's a there's a certain section of microbes which are definitely bad but the other ones are probably all right if not good yeah i think uh, that's what, interesting from the last couple of uh, talks is that there is like this sort of interesting gray area where mm. between what is what we can very easily a sign as being bad or good for us. Mm. And it's interesting to know that as we're gaining more and more uh, information and scientific know-how, that we're realizing that there's certain things we might have presumed to be bad early, which have actually are good and vice versa. Yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, Lucy, I uh, thank you very much and enjoy Prague. I guess it's your first time here, despite you've been well, so well-traveled. So enjoy your adventure in Prague and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, sticking on to the, well, the, the topic, really, did you know that um, half of all species are parasites living on perhaps you now, as we currently speak? And <laughs> indeed, we now know that there are, there are parasites of parasites. So we've got these layered structures, these hierarchies of parasitic uh, beings which are, which are living off one another. And to talk to us about this is they're certainly not parasitic, but the lovely uh, Maureen Williams, who is currently in Ireland, although you, you, in fact, you can tell from the smile that you're from America. <laughs> yes, yeah, and, the uh, accent gives it, gives it away. away. <laughs> and indeed, from the sun, sunshine state of, of Florida. And your PhD uh, is in uh, aquatic uh, ecology and, and parasitology, and indeed, zombies. Yeah. So, so some parasites are actually able to control the behavior of their hosts, 
at which point the hosts have no say in what it. they're doing. I see. But so, well, that's a, that's a scary and also fascinating prospect, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank, Thank you, you, Maureen. In the fight against the diseases of the future, we have a secret weapon. The secret weapon is sitting here with all of us. It's our common sense. Common sense is the reason why most of you have not heard of dracunculiasis. It's a disease that infected three and a half million people in 1986. It's called dracunculiasis, which means little dragons, because that's what it feels like. Small dragons burrowing through your body. I know none of you want to have this, so how did we get to the point where there were only 30 cases last year? Well, dracunculiasis is a parasite. It's called guinea worm, and it starts its life in water fleas. When you go to take a drink of water, you accidentally drink in some of the water fleas, and the boys meet the girls in your stomach, they get down to business, and they're ready to reproduce. At that point, the parasite tunnels through your body into your foot. This feels like your foot is on fire, and you'll do anything to get some relief. What you usually do is you stick your foot into some nice cooling water, a little bit of relief. But that's when the parasite strikes. It tunnels out through the bottom of your foot, sticks its butt out through the hole that it just made, and lays its eggs into the water. The parasite is then able to continue its life cycle, but you're left with a parasite sticking out of your foot. You have no choice but over the next three weeks to slowly wind the parasite around a stick because if the parasite breaks or is left inside your body, you could die. This sounds terrible. How were we able to almost get rid of it? Well, we had two common sense answers. The first thing that happened was the World Health Organization went around and gave everyone straws. In the straws were small filters, so when you go to drink water, you don't take in the initial stage of the parasite. If you don't get the parasite, you don't have the problems later. The second thing that they did was they employed people to sit by areas of water and say, hey you, with the parasite sticking out of your leg, you're not allowed to go in the water today. By doing those two things, we've gotten to the point where guinea worm is only present in four countries in the entire world, and even then, two of those countries had no new cases last year. These really common sense measures have allowed us to get to a point where no one in the future will hopefully feel this tunneling fire through their bodies. There are so many diseases that are just on the doorstep. There are so many things that could happen to hurt people. But today, I believe that the answer to those problems is within each of us. And the more people know, the more people are able to come up with these common sense answers and help save people in the future. Thank you. Well, well thank you, Maureen. What, that was a, a fantastic story full of hope and dread. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, has anybody had such a feeling a sensation of tunneling dragons through your leg and feet? No, but uh, uh, any questions for Maureen? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So how long does it take to unwind the, the, the parasite from your, from your leg? So it depends on the size of the parasite. Um, sometimes the parasites can be about this big and it can take about three weeks because if you go too fast, it breaks and then you can die. So you wind it around the stick and you just keep the stick attached to your leg for three weeks. You can't walk anywhere, you can't do anything. It's pretty devastating. Um, and have, you, have you actually seen, have you witnessed this? Um, so there were only 30 cases last year, so I have not personally seen someone with it, thankfully. Um, we have some of the worms preserved and I've seen videos. But hopefully, you know, we're getting to a point where I will never be able to see it, which I think is pretty great. And do you think, sorry, yes, <laughs> questions here. How many worms can you have in your body? So there's no limit, um, <laughs> oh dear. unfortunately. Uh, usually you only present with about two or three, but um, it depends on how heavy the infection is. You can actually end up with like up to 20 or 30. 
pretty bad. Yes? So if, if, if it breaks inside you, you know, what, what do you do next? What do we do next? Yeah, so the first thing to do would be to start a course of antibiotics immediately. Um, and then almost always you have to go into surgery. The problem is, is that where this is still happening, so where it's still a problem, it's usually in areas of a lot of conflict. So it's really hard to get people to doctors then. Um, so the best thing that you can do is equip people with lots of antibiotics at the start and tell people as soon as you know it's happened, you have to go. Do these worms inhabit other organisms other than humans? That is a fantastic question. So the biggest challenge we have right now, the reason why it's not all the way gone, is in Ethiopia, the parasite has actually made the jump from humans to dogs. It's only just started in the last 10 years. Um, no one was expecting this to happen. It's really uncommon. And it's a lot harder to convince a dog not to get into the water. Um, than it is with people, especially because um, the current treatment is to chain up the dogs that are infected. And, you know, no one likes to see a dog chained up and people will go in the middle of the night and set them free. But then that's continuing the parasite's life cycle. So what people are doing right now, today, um, they're working on ways to figure out where the dogs are getting the parasites to see if we can stop the dogs from getting them initially, and then trying to figure out ways that we can apply the same sorts of methods to dogs to help stop it entirely. Any other questions? If not, then Maury, thank you very much for your, for your dissection about <laughs> these parasites. Let's hope that thanks to your work, there'll be less than half of the species of flora and fauna on this planet uh, as parasites. Uh, but uh, somebody who is certainly not a parasite, but is a, is a, a contributor to our, our know-how and, and, and advance, scientific advance in this world, is our next guest from the Czech Republic, although originally from Germany, uh, Ansgar Gruber. And Ansgar will be uh, talking to us about about nitrogen, I believe, and about how things can grow almost out of, or indeed out of, thin air. Now, the two of us have both got thin hair, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm, I'm fascinated to hear and learn about how things can grow from thin air. So, Angus, the, the, the floor is yours. What do we want? One thing we have in common, we want energy, and we want to grow in size, in weight, and in numbers. For growth, we need food, and our biggest problem would be if we ran out of food. To feed us, we have only one resource, plants. This one here I call basalka, but I actually mean all plants or algae that we can eat. Basalka doesn't need food. She builds up her own biomass from carbon dioxide in the air, from water, and from nitrogen salts in the soil. And she takes her energy from the sunlight. This lifestyle is called photosynthetic. Now I can eat parts of basalka, and I'm happy. For energy, I can only use the carbon. And for my growth, I need both. I need carbon, and I need a bit of nitrogen. So this nitrogen left over is actually useless to me. So I can generously give it back to Basalka. In real life, this would be P. So, Basalka and I, we are ready to repeat. We are in a sustainable relationship, isn't it? Well, I can't fool you and neither can I fool Basalka as long as I am growing I cannot possibly give back as much nitrogen to Basalka as I took from her. 
And that's the reason why we need nitrogen fertilizers. Fertilizers provide the nutrients to the plants that we take from them for our own growth. Okay, so you're a nitrogen sink where you're taking some and giving some back. But um, I suppose the cycle would complete but when we finally end our days just to bury ourselves next to a bazalka plant, plant and it'll get it back. Yeah. But I suppose it's quicker to, to, to fertilize, right? Well, the, the truth is. When we die, we give the biomass that we consist of back. But in the meantime, most of us will have multiplied. So most of us will have had children. So when we have children, actually, mother already gives part of her biomass to the baby, and it continues. Um, and then baby grows. And there is a constant growth of, uh, of the human population, and all that human population has a biomass. And that nitrogen in the human population has to come from the food. Mm. And it comes, you can source it to the plants, because even if we eat meat, it comes from the plants. And a lot of that biomass actually comes from nitrogen fertilizers. And the growth of the population wouldn't have been possible without the contribution of nitrogen fertilizers. Indeed, and there's an interesting, uh, yes. So the question is, do nitrogen fertilizers influence the quality of the soil? Yeah, so that, that's a very good question, and it depends, on the, it depends on the soil and on the situation in which we are. So back in the days, my grandparents, they had a farm. They didn't have the mineral fertilizers. They had to take what the animals gave them and put it to the field. And in that case, this was a losing, uh, losing side, because the animals always bring back less if you feed them from what you have in the field then they always bring back less. So at the time when nitrogen fertilizers were new, for them it was an improvement and it helped them to have more yield from the field because they could replace the nitrogen that was taken for the growth. Today, it's different. Today, especially in Europe, there is a big problem with nitrogen content in the, in the groundwater and in basically all water. And the reason for that is that, is that we bring out too much of manure, the liquid and also solid leftovers from, from the animals. And that is a concentration effect, because all those animals that we keep for meat production, they are fed from biomass that we import. So there's soy imported from Brazil or from China. It's fed to the European animals. And then the European animals, the le their leftovers, they are not carried back to the places where their food has been produced, but the leftovers are dumped in Europe where the, the, the animals are, uh, are kept. And that causes to the local over-fertilization of, of the soils. And that's actually a big problem. So things have, trained, have flipped, totally flipped, soon after uh, nitrogen fertilizers were introduced. Mm -hmm. So we... Yes, yes. Um, how many years can we use the... How many more years can we use the nitrogen fertilizers? Are they a limited resource, or do we have a, like a petrol limit? Are nitrogen fertilizers a limited resource? Um, the nitrogen fertilizers are actually produced from N2, from air, essentially. It's a Haber process, isn't it? it? It's, it's, an, it's an industrial process. It's called a Haber-Bosch uh, process. And um, when that was invented, nitrogen fertilizers only became, um, became affordable to... to uh, to farmers. Previously, they had to be imported from fossil sources, actually from South America. And um, the, since it can be produced, it's basically sustainable. It's energy intensive, though. So there's uh, a lot of energy going into this process. But apart from the energy, it only needs the air, which is, uh, uh, for practical purposes, unlimited. Um, but there are other nutrients that are more critical. So um, I talked about nitrogen. There's also phosphorus. Phosphorus actually is much more difficult to bring to, to the field, and it becomes limiting 
slowly, and that might be uh, that might be problematic in the future. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, Dash, tell me the time is time is of the time is getting urgently short. So, thank you very much for your interesting talk about the nitrogen cycle and uh, the Bazalka plant. And uh, our our final contribution, our, our last but certainly not least, uh, is from a, a local lass, uh, Lucia uh, Dolejalkova. And she is uh, currently studying biochemistry at Charles University in Prague, just round the corner. But as you can see, has also got a, a wonderful, well, you've got many interests here in plants, photography, hiking and climbing, playing recorders, and indeed, as we see here, the saxophone. But uh, uh, Lucy, you're going to be uh, telling us about what, this t what today? Uh, well, about the plants and the stress. Uh, this saxophone is here because... Yeah, I feel a little bit nervous. So if you don't mind, I will play the saxophone uh, when I'm not able to talk. So well, fact, well, I'm looking forward I to hearing fail, about plants. I will play you at least the saxophone. Lucy, you can tell us about some plants and then play us out on the saxophone. That'd be fantastic. Oh my God, I'm, I'm late. I'm late with my diploma thesis, right here. I'm standing in front of all you, and I have nothing to say. I'm stressed, and I guess you know that feeling, right? But what can one do about it? How can we manage the stress? Well, one way is to fight. Or maybe, I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. The fight or flight response is well known in animals, like us. But try to fight with no arms. Try to fly with your uh, feet stuck in the ground. Do you think that plants cannot feel the stress? Oh, that's not true. Have you ever been to holiday? Of course you were. And your plants stand there at home. It is bad enough that they were there instead with you on the sun beach, but they also had no water. How can a plant uh, fight? Well, there are these small molecules. You might think they are not important, but actually they are quite important. We call them plant stress hormones. And for example, here, this is abscisic acid, and it is helping the plants with water stress. Also, we do have uh, brassinosteroids, or hmm, ethylene, which helps with flooding. There is also systemin, which helps with the parasites. We have heard of them before. But the plant parasites are quite different. Uh, why is it important? Why do we actually study the plant stress hormones? The answer is quite easy. Even you, if you are stressed, you are not productive. The plants have the same. They might stop growing, they might die. But if we think of, for example, crops and the fields, these plants are really not important to us. We don't care of them quite often, but we need them. We need them for feeding us. Today, there is at this planet 7.5 billion people, and each seventh of them is starving, actually. This is here, and right now. And this problem will get worse. In the next seven years, there's going to be eight uh, billion people living on this planet. Can we feed them all? Well, we might uh, be trusting the politics, that they will help us with the changing climate conditions. But I would rather uh, believe uh, to the scientists and that they can do Actually, they can improve the stress uh, reactions in plants and that we can actually make more food for all of us. Thank you. Well, sh should we have some questions before we play it? Put ourselves out on the, on the saxophone. So, anybody feeling a bit stressed out? No, everybody's relaxed here. So, obviously, yes, there's a, there's a question here. What does it actually do? 
Okay, so the question is, if a plant is, say, stressed out, that it's not got enough water, how do these chemicals help them out? Uh, well, uh, we can imagine uh, that uh, plants do have mouths, as we do, and they are actually having many of them. We call them stomata. And uh, the abscisic acid causes the stomata to close. So the plant is not uh, losing the water by breathing, but also the photosynthesis uh, levels are uh, lowered. So you should balance uh, the stress response with the actual metabolism that is going on in the plant. If you don't balance it, then the plant dies. And humans, when, when we're under stress, uh, chemistry often plays a, a role, a, you know, a sort of a, <laughs> is often something we rely upon to relieve that stress. Mm -hmm. I mean, exercise is one, one aspect people often do. Meditation is another. Um, the consumption of chemicals such as alcohol or THC, whatever it might be. There's, there's all different routes. Do, do, plants, use, do plants use exercise? Do, do plants, is there any evidence that plants somehow meditate in a way? I don't know. Is, there, is, well, is, is that a silly question? Well, we are actually thinking of uh, whether the, a plant uh, can think or... We all uh, have uh, some uh, neural um, transmitters or we do have our brains that are actually thinking there is some electric signals going on in our brains. It seems like plants do have some electric uh, signals going on in also, but we don't know how this works. So I guess that the plant cannot meditate. <laughs> and uh, with the exercise, it's even worse. So the only uh, heroes in these stories are these molecules. Uh, yes. Do you think it does make sense to talk with the plants? Does it make sense to talk to your plants? Prince Charles does. Uh, well, it is a good question. Uh, we never thought that uh, it will play some role to touch the plant, for example. Recently, we found out that the plant, when it's touched, it can feel it, actually, and it, uh, do, it does uh, react to it. For example, if you touch the grass on uh, your lawn, it won't uh, get as uh, high as uh, the usually, or it would, uh, with the lack of uh, any touch. So, they can perceive it, maybe, maybe not. Well, yeah, I think it's nice to talk to your friends, even when they are the plants one. <laughs> yes, Dasha. I've heard that uh, certain music helps them to grow better, and that, that's why I told them to grow the steps of music. Oh, I haven't uh, thought of it. Okay. <laughs> well, if there's no further questions, I suggest maybe you can, can you play us a, a tune on the saxophone? And I would like uh, the others to come to me, and maybe what a good we can idea. dance. <laughs> So perhaps, uh, if, if we're going to play ourselves out, this is an opportunity for me to thank all of you for coming, Dasha for organizing the event, all of our uh, contributions from all our wonderful guests from home and abroad. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed uh, today's Echoes of Fame Lab and uh, enjoy our play out. Have a nice weekend. Thank you.